My topic here today is, uh, is uh, the risk and the quality and uh, some of the issues that take place outside the operating room. Uh, so what does this curve have to do with that? Well, this is the, the world record in discus throwing by age. And this guy on the picture is 100 years old. And as you can see from the uh, picture here, at the age of 100, the world discus record is 10 meters. And, uh, and it's an interesting curve because uh, uh, it's reasonable to assume that uh, this curve applies also to the rest of the body, not only the strength in your arm when you throw the discus. It probably also reflects the deterioration of our physiologic reserves with age. And that's a key issue, I think, when we discuss risk and quality and how we deal with with uh, the increasing aging population which uh, we meet in the operating rooms and preferably before they come to the, to the operating, uh, operating rooms. So what does this have to do with, uh, with safety and quality? Well, it's highly relevant in this picture because as I mentioned yesterday also, death within 30 days of admission to surgery is reported to be the third largest cause of death in the United States. Uh, and if this is true in the United States, it's probably also true in our part of the world. And this probably reflects the fact that we operate more and more old people with, uh, with the comorbidity with very reduced physiologic reserves. So the question is how uh, how do we deal with this risk? How can we possibly reduce the number of people who die at some time shortly following surgery? And it's related, I think, to the physiologic uh, reserves. So, so why, why do the patients die postoperatively? And it has been established that they don't primarily die because of surgical complications. They die for medical reasons. They die because uh, their physiologic reserves collapse, they have uh, heart failure, the lungs start to fail, the kidneys, they have infections, they have cognitive decline, and then they slowly die in the days and weeks and months after surgery. And it's certainly related, I think, to the balance between, on the one hand, the inflammatory reaction, which is triggered by the surgery, and the defenses the patient has to somehow combat what happens uh, in relation to surgery. And the key question, of course, is whether we operate patients who are unable to benefit from the surgery that we are doing. So that is the $64,000 question. Uh, and this is just to underline what, uh, what I said. Uh, there are many studies showing that there is, uh, uh, the, uh, there is a huge inflammatory reaction uh, which follows surgery. Uh, and this inflammatory reaction is associated in many studies with organ failure. Uh, this is a study which is in press in Okta, which shows the same thing, that uh, SIRS as well as surgical APGAR score independently predict kidney failure, but it's also related to failure of, of other organs. So that is one of the key questions. So for us, this poses a number of challenges, which uh, Rupert Pierce and others spoke about yesterday. Uh, and all these elements in the process that the patient goes through from long before they come to the operating room. Uh, you could start with the, with the GP, the general practitioner, so who should always be involved, and uh, the pre-op evaluation, and our communication with the surgeons and all the others who are involved in treating the patient. And the handover of care is a topic of great interest when it comes to risk. It has been shown many times that the handover of information, and there are multiple situations on the way, uh, are critical because critical information may be lost and complications may occur because of that. And when we 
start to operate on these people? Do we actually have a plan for how we deal with the patients afterwards? Do they have a place in the post-op unit, in the intensive care? Do we give them proper care on the wards? I'm not going to touch that question. That I will leave that to the other speakers. And again, does the patient have the possibility to benefit from what we are doing to the, to the patient? So there are many questions here. How do we deal with the risk? Can we better assess the risk? There are a number of scores. There are comorbidity index, there are frailty scores, there are uh, the ASA score, and there are multiple scores, which all are fairly good at predicting risk for groups of patients. The challenge is when you want to predict the risk for individual patients. And we discussed this briefly with, with Dr. Pierce yesterday, and, uh, and uh, Michelle Chu also. And uh, I think maybe we are moving slowly forward uh, when it comes to being able to, uh, to predict individual risk. But we still have a way to go there. Particularly if we ask ourselves questions, should we operate the patient at all? Should we perhaps let the patient die instead of operating on the patients? In order to make that kind of decision, you need uh, better ways of doing individual risk predictions. And then the second question here is whether we can modify the risk. Uh, again, a big question. Uh, there is a lot of focus now on prehabilitation. We more and more tell the patients to stop smoking, for instance. We tell them to exercise if we have the time to do it before the operation. Stop drinking, optimize the diseases, and so on. And one key question, which I will return to, is we do often specialist consultations. We ask a cardiologist or a pulmonologist to have a look at the patient. But perhaps we should more and more uh, make an alliance with the geriatricians, because they are really the last generalists in our hospital, perhaps in addition to us, because they see the whole patient. They don't see just one, one organ. And then when we have sort of quantified the risk and discussed with our colleagues, can we somehow manage the situation better? Should we do a lesser operation? Should we not operate? And who operates? Who operates? That's a big question which I think is interesting. Should these fragile patients be operated by, by the youngest doctors in the middle of the night? That happens uh, many times, unfortunately. And can we give better anesthesia? There are many things here that we need to look at in order to try and improve the quality and reduce the risk for the patients who travel the pathway through the operating rooms. Preoperative assessment clinics. Uh, I think in my time in the anesthesia department in Trondheim, this is one of the most important steps forward. We started doing this, I think, at least 10 years ago, and by now we have a fairly well-established and well-functioning pre-op assessment clinic. And it's been a major step forward in terms of quality, the way I see it. Everybody is better prepared. Not only the patient and the relatives, but the surgeon as well as the anesthetist. And more and more we talk together and discuss in advance. We have fewer cancellations and uh, the people who sit on the money bag and they have the logistic responsibility are very happy about that. And there are shorter hospital stays because the patients are much better prepared. And, uh, but one key question which has not been solved around the world is the time from assessment in the pre-op clinic until the time of surgery. And that, I think, in many places is a very critical, critical question. Uh, I work mostly in the orthopedic uh, section, and uh, we are in the position that very often we do have time to do optimization and perhaps have the patient uh, change the lifestyle and eat some iron to get the hemoglobin up and things like that. But that's not always the case in other subspecialties, like for instance in cancer surgery. So there is a challenge here. You don't always have much time from assessment until. But I think we often have more time than, uh, than, uh, than is the case in many places today. And the preoperative assessment clinic is associated with lower morbidity and mortality. That has been um, 
shown in several studies. This one is from anesthesiology <coughs> last year. Uh, the results were not very impressive in my opinion, but there was an association here. There was a lower morbidity and mortality in the group that had been through the pre-op assessment clinic. But one thing they had not standardized in this investigation was the timing from the assessment until the patient was operated. Frailty has been brought up as, uh, as a concept which uh, has received considerable attention and, and interest around the world. Maybe, maybe frailty is a concept which is, uh, which is uh, of interest and, and valuable when it comes to assessing, assessing uh, risk. And very briefly, the frailty phenotype is unintended weight loss, self-reported exhaustion, general weakness, slow walking, and very low physical activity. And you can expand this by including anemia and incipient kidney failure and many other sub-elements. So, um, and I think the frailty concept is, is an interesting one. And the question then, of course, is can frailty be modified? Can you do anything about it if you have a frail patient? Again, that's the key question. And in the UK, they have a movement called the proactive care of older people undergoing surgery. You can, you can Google POPs if you want to, and you'll find information about this. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. And they have, at St. Thomas in London, they have included geriatricians in the, in the big picture in the extensively. And uh, it's very, very interesting. And uh, I've heard the last uh, author of this publication in, in BGA, uh, Dr. Desi, uh, she has uh, participated in our Scandinavian perioperative course a couple of times and it's fantastic to listen to her, to hear the enthusiasm and what they have done in order to incorporate the geriatricians in the pe perioperative team. And it's because, as they say in this, in this uh, publication, a single organ doctor may not be the best one to take care of these complex medical situations. And a lot has been written about orthogeriatrics in orthopedics, but uh, this uh, certainly, in my opinion, applies also to many other, other uh, specialties. And uh, this study from the British Journal of Surgery this year illustrate that, uh, these are, these are, this is vascular surgery, illustrate that if the patients are dealt with by the geriatricians, dedicated geriatricians, before as well as after the operation, they seem to have fewer complications and lower mortality than those who have not been exposed to geriatric expertise. And then we have the problem which I alluded to earlier, the handover situations. I'm not going to, uh, to talk a lot about this, but uh, much has been written about this. And if you think about the patients going through the system, there are many, many steps on the way from home to home, and there are many handover situations where critical information may be lost unless we are aware of, of the situation. And as uh, stated here by Manser and the co-workers, and Rona Flynn is also in on this publication. She's from Aberdeen. Um, she takes part in our Scandinavian courses and talks about this. Uh, it's not just a question of having a tick box exercise to uh, when you when you deliver the patient to the next step you also have to uh, to actually convey an assessment and a judgment about what to anticipate uh, and to discuss this in addition to the tick boxing uh, which um, we're used to doing this is about intraoperative transition of of anesthesia care and it's an interesting handover situation as well, because in anesthesia we, much too often, I think, hand over difficult paci patients to new doctors and new nurses because the shift is over. Whereas the surgeons, they stay there until uh, the battle is over, so to speak. But we very often hand over things to, to others. We go home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and, and tell the nurse to call someone else when you approach the end of the operation, that kind of thing. Unfortunately, it happens often. And as is illustrated by this, um, this investigation, uh, the more handover situations you have, uh, the more likely is it that you have some kind of complication happening to that uh, patient. 
And then perhaps the most important and most difficult of all the questions which are related to risk and quality, the department culture. Uh, and these are some uh, quotes from uh, James Reason. I'm sure you know James Reason, the psychologist from Manchester, the guy with the, with the Swiss cheese model. And uh, how to define culture. The way we do things around here, it's a pretty good uh, definition. The second one is perhaps even better. What happens when no one is watching you? Uh, that reflects the culture of the department. And I think he's right in what he says at the end here, that only culture can reach all parts of the system, and only culture can exert a consistent influence for good or evil, preferably for good than in, in our case. And uh, a key issue here is for all of us who work in the system is to experience a uh, cultural psychological safety, where, is it, where it's safe to speak up to authority. It is a problem in many places. To being able to have sort of a flat, uh, flat uh, authority gradient where people feel relaxed and feel that they dare to speak up if something has happened is uh, of tremendous value for quality and safety in any, any department. And this quotation from the airline industry, aviation crashes are often the result of subordinates not speaking up even when their own lives are at stake. And uh, there was a pilot in Norway who wrote a PhD thesis about, uh, around this topic, and he was quite clear in his conclusion that it's very dangerous when you have a too authoritarian captain uh, in the cockpit. And my last topic is, um, you're all familiar with fast track. Uh, fast track is fine, and standardized uh, patients sort of uh, patterns is also fine for many, many diagnoses and many types of operations, but it doesn't fit all. Uh, more and more patients, I would say at least 30% of our patient mass are old people with multiple comorbidities and they don't fit into the, into the fast track uh, picture. And in our hospital at least, I'm quite certain that many patients leave the hospital much too early because there is no room for them in the hospital. The hospital is filled up with patients. And the same thing has happened in all the Scandinavian countries. The number of somatic hospital beds has been cut with 50% roughly in all our countries. And nowadays in my country, patients are sent out of the hospital many much too early. And it's a rapidly growing group. And these patients, in my opinion, may be the losers in the sort of the modern healthcare business where everybody is concentrated on production, logistics, and the financial bottom line. So this is a threat also to, uh, to the quality of this growing population. And with these words, I end my talk and expect my colleagues to talk more about what happens on the ward. Perhaps there is, should be more anesthesiologists also on the ward to take care of what happens there. Thank you.